please, please join me in giving Dr. Kate Kinsella a very warm Minnesota <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, although yesterday I was like, life is good. I'm here at San Francisco. I'm enjoying my cup of coffee. And then Minneapolis St. Paul canceled. So took an act of God, many prayers, channeling my Irish Catholic mother, you know, please light a votive candle. And uh, politeness in prayer got me, and also my premier status, uh, got me begging with the United people, I have got to be there. So I've learned to be super polite. The, the, the one person during the day who's not an angry you know, uh, person at the poor United rep and told them what I'm doing and, and told them what I was going to be doing today. And boy, they worked all kinds of feats. I didn't get in until 11 o'clock last night, but uh, I am here and excited. I am the kind of person who wants a handout. I don't want to just look at slides and have a presenter say, oh, uh, I, I could send that to you later. On the table, there are some handouts in color. I'll give mine to anyone who doesn't have one. Uh, and I would urge you to reference it as I'm going through. The digital files also available for you. Uh, for my keynote, I'm going to be focusing on how to have lessons where English learners are interacting. Uh, whether they are in a dedicated English language development class or whether they are integrated in an elementary, middle, or high school um, uh, content area classroom. I'll be drawing on my work. As Amy mentioned, I'm a researcher and scholar, but also practitioner. And I have school districts from San Diego to Phoenix to Chicago to New York, where I'm doing intensive work and in rural areas of my own California um, state, where we are working with all teachers to be better advocates for English learners, but also more effective in their pedagogy. And bedrock, where we need to start is to get them flexing their language muscles in class. And in the past three years, I assumed a position with the Office of Civil Rights. I'm their lead consultant and an advisor on English language development, in particular in secondary schools. And I will tell you, I've had some ulcer-inducing just I need to say a prayer to the patron saint of desperate causes, you know, observing multilingual learners in their science class, in their English language development class, or even in their English language development class, they are not speaking. Raise your hand if you're a little concerned about your English learners performing on the weed of writing assessment component. If you don't have your hand up, I don't know what you mixed in your latte. Uh, <laughs> because our reading and writing scores are in the toilet in the United States. So we're 20 years regressed after um, the pandemic. And you cannot write what you cannot say. So if you're sitting quietly, you're not in class all the time, you're not going to channel lots of great language for a writing assessment. I draw from research and scholarship in my work in the field, as well as my personal life in my work. We are very fortunate to have two beautiful adopted children. Our daughter, Jane Zung, is ethnic Vietnamese um, from a minority group in North Vietnam. She just graduated from Wellesley with honors, graduated from high school with the seal of biliteracy in English, French, Spanish. And she's like, Mommy, please don't say I, I, say I teach, I speak Arabic. You know, just because I spent a year, you know, in Morocco studying and living with a family, and um, because I'm high intermediate, um, but she's, <laughs> Going to do, uh, she's going to do diplomatic cultural heritage law and working with uh, protecting, particularly in the Middle East, North Africa, and Southeast Asia. So we're very proud. Our beautiful son, we adopted at three and a half from Guatemala, and we knew he had special needs. And he was indigenous and only knew a few Spanish words. And many of you have told me you have Central American students in your middle and high schools and that they're coming as unaccompanied minors with gaps. Um, we live and breathe it on the home front. Fortunately, graduated from high school, 504 plan. Good thing I was home because digital learning was really not very good for him. And um, he's a lifelong English learner. And when we look at your academic standards for Minnesota, if you take this speaking and listening standard um, just in your core content, that all students, regardless of their background, need to participate effectively in a range of conversations and collaborations, expressing their own clearly and persuasively. 
I'm in middle and high schools a lot, and in elementary. I've been wined into working with elementary, so we just wrapped up a five-year research project in K-3, funded by the U.S. Department of Education, and rocked it with the data, even in the pandemic, teaching little second graders, are there my ideas similar to Jesse's? And I'm gonna show some video footage. They love academic language, they think it's sexy. And <laughs> long-term English learners, of which are a focal point of my work, are created in primary grades. It starts there. And so we want them to be clocking in miles on the tongue and not intimidated about using precise words. Because I spend a lot of time in middle school, when you say, all right, students, turn and talk, there isn't a single student in class who says, I better sit up and get ready for some accountable academic interaction. <laughs> I'm gonna establish eye contact with my partner and get ready to hear some precise, thoughtful you know, content and to provide feedback. You know, regardless of their background, you're lucky if they do this and turn their head. And I am very supportive of your academic standards, but this standard, which was you know, co-opted from the Common Core, if you will, and is in my own state and other states I work in, I feel the architects of the writing were a little sloppy because participate effectively in a range of conversations and collaborations. Um, I'm gonna talk about the difference between conversation and collaboration and conversation and academic discussion. In my work with students, I had an epiphany. Uh, when we came out with our national career and college readiness standards in 2011-12, you know, and realizing we don't, our standards are asking that we treat all of our students as aspiring scholars. Students who really have options when they graduate from high school. And I don't say scholar in a pretentious way, like everyone's going to be an Ivy League candidate. You know, whether they want to be a vet tech or a veterinarian, um, that every student I want to feel that when I come to teach them, I'm treating them like students with goals. And scholars, I tell them, you're going to be my language scholars and my literacy scholars. And scholars are people like Malala Yousafzai that are passionate about a topic like Greta Thunberg, that are passionate um, and that enjoy talking to people about what they're learning and writing about it. And when we look at the standards, really what the standards are saying is not that they should just have lots of conversations in school, but they engage in academic discussion, that they engage in academic collaboration. And in my work with middle schools and high schools, I find most of them haven't had an epiphany that when the teacher says you need to collaborate, it doesn't mean divide and conquer. You do that part, I'll do that part, and we won't talk about anything, and there will be no quality control. When you collaborate, that's very different. Discussion is exchanging ideas on an academic topic, and collaboration means you need to work together and have a product and have consensus. In the three research projects that I've wrapped up recently, um, focusing on English learners and focusing on academic English learners, raise your hand if you, have, you serve students who are not multilingual learners, but who have real compelling academic language needs, just as much as your recent immigrants from Afghanistan. And when you are going to have interactive tasks, I'm going to implore you, do not just say turn and talk. Don't just say, get together with your neighbor and share out. Um, display directions. I'm trying to break our elementary school teachers' habits of just giving lots of verbal directions because they cannot hold those directions in their short-term memory, in their auditory storage, process what you said, and get ready for that task. One of the cost-free things you can do is have slides or interaction cards I go low tech, I use my document camera a lot where I can put it down, where they're seeing. So later I'm gonna show a clip and talk about the need to let multilingual learners share two times. First to rehearse, second with expression. But also, raise your hand if you serve some students, you're a passionate advocate of multilingual learners, but you have some that are adorable slackers. <laughs> and whether it's elementary or secondary, you know, it's like, Yo, Dr. Kinsella, I don't share, you know, or like, I take a pass. No, not in this class, call me Cruella Kinsella, but everybody's <laughs> going to be speaking. Nobody gets a pass. This is your English language development class. And so we're going to give them listening goals. 
Like, you need to restate your partner's idea. So if, if we're sharing reasons, they'll say, so, you, so, so Lenny, so your reason is? And then for the partner to say, yes, that's correct, or yes, that's right, or no, I said. That's a life skill for an English learner. They need to be able to tell their part-time uh, manager at the gap, you know. Um, so you're saying that you'd like me to come early tomorrow to show me how to use the cash register? No, not exactly. What I'd like, you know, it buys explanations. Similarly, this is for a discussion task, but if I want them to collaborate, I want that word up there, collaborative task, so they know this is something you are doing with your team or your partner, and we need to, this is the most common collaborative task I have for reading selections. So if we're having three key questions about this text section, you're gonna discuss ways to answer the question and agree upon the response. I'll provide a response frame, like the key idea in this section is. You're gonna write it and report, because when you report on behalf of a partnership or a team, you don't say, I think. You need to say, we decided. We discussed many examples, but we decided, or we determined. Now, to engage in academic interactions across the school day, from math, to art, to music, to science, to language arts, to social studies, students need to engage in a lot of language for academic interaction purposes. And recently, I taught some high school English learners how to hold the floor because other classmates were chronically interrupting them. So when they were just trying to get their response out to be able to say, so if I could return to what I was trying to say, so as I was saying, when someone else blurts out or interrupts them, that students need to be able to state opinions, support them, um, uh, compare, and many of these are speaking standards, others are listening, and I'll elaborate. All of your students come to school being able to express an opinion on some basic level, but I find working with academic English learners and long-term English learners, they get to high school with only one verb in their toolkit, one phrase, I think. And they, no one's taught them to say, after reading this article about cyberbullying, oh, I believe, or in my opinion, students who engage in cyberbullying we need to start building their toolkit to express opinions starting in primary grades and add to it. Because if we're going to say you're going to be professional workplace ready, if you're going to be college ready, everybody doesn't sit around saying, I think, I think, I think. We need to be able to say things. From my perspective, we should give the client an alternative product. And similarly, when I'm working with students who are underprepared with content and language, They'll just say, I think, well, why? Because. Let's use the formal variety of that word, because. And, uh, but but the, if you, they are going to have to support their opinion with, with relevant information, if it's an example, tell them to say, for example. If they're going to be sharing an experience to say, I had a recent experience to give them, or a major reason is, our standards, your standards harp upon the need for students to build on others' ideas. I have yet to see a middle or high school student say, um, respectfully, um, uh, I understand the perspectives of my classmates, um, but I would like to add that. There's like, uh, everybody said my stuff. And um, <laughs> we need to basic with newcomers to teach them my idea builds upon Tony's, you know. Even if it's exactly the same idea, to, and you're adding a little information, and right up that alley, day one with kindergarten or ninth grade, everybody's gonna be accountable for comparing. Because in any class, there are a lot of popular ideas to be able to at least listen for whose idea is Lior like yours, and to teach them my idea is a lot like Renee's, my idea is similar to Andrea's. I'm working in districts where they're obsessed about the content teachers having language objectives. I'm thinking, you know what? Writing a language objective, heck, my publishers can't even write them. You know, the editors can't write them. Writing language objectives is a science and an art. 
I am not so worried about them not having an effectively written language objective in their lesson. I don't care how it's written. I want to see language delivery, because I've seen some great language objectives on the board. The lesson just doesn't include any attention to language. But an effective language objective names the function. For example, state a claim using present tense persuasive verbs. I support. I maintain. Or exchanging information collaboratively to be able to teach students to say, what's your idea? What's your perspective? A really strong language objective names what they're supposed to do and names the language. And there are frequent flyer language objectives. I'm going to have my students reporting their group's decision all throughout the year. But I can add a different verb. Because language objectives are so hard to write, I included a whole page in the handout on well-written language objectives that are aligned with speaking and listening for academic interaction. And over the course of a school year in a unit, I don't have 50 different language objectives. There are many repeat objectives, but just with slightly different language, if you will. I included an academic interaction card in your handout that is in PDF. And in a past life, like many of you, I was sort of an itinerant English as a second language teacher, running to classrooms, putting up all my posters. And I kind of realized in, in retrospect that I had too much language on the board, that it's often overwhelming. And I created, and it's had different iterations, an academic interaction card that could be photocopied on cardstock or copied um, to, with two sides. And part of it is for discussion and part of it is for collaboration. This is language for those of you supporting colleagues across the school day. This is the kind of card students in grades four through 12 should have in their binder, should have in their backpack. And I have a younger version that I didn't include. But if you look, for example, at the reason I put two colors is so I could say, students, turn to the blue side. Point to number four. Make sure your partner is on number four. Put a sticky underneath the first bullet, the first phrase. Today, we're going to be comparing and also building upon ideas in this discussion. And we're going to be doing this for the whole month until it's so comfortable with you, we can move on to another phrase to do that. So we're going to today be saying, my idea is similar to, and you'll name the classmate. So this isn't something I just give them as a gift and say, rise to the occasion, use it. The teacher needs to point out, we're going to be doing this and helping them with that. Academic interaction, whether discussion or collaboration, is not a casual conversation. I rarely use the word conversation in my instruction. All your students have opportunities to have conversations at lunch, in passing period, before school. The standards aren't really asking for conversation. They're asking for academic interaction. And I tell students sometimes, I'll say, I want you just to quickly brainstorm using everyday English, Farsi, whatever you want. Just quickly brainstorm. But conversations are to get to know people, an informal conversation, an informal exchange. I tell them before class, I, I have conversations with teachers in the hallway, you know, in the mail room, and we're just talking about things like how his daughter's wedding went, oh, what happened when he got a flat tire on the way to work today, we're talking about the weather. But the purpose, when I'm talking with teachers at a meeting or your parents at a meeting, I'm engaging in discussion. Casual conversation is really brief phrases. My son is a reticent speaker, and I did a lot of prep this summer for him to be able to get into a build academy for 18 to 25 year olds. They're paid 15 an hour because the last thing he wanted to do is, oh, I'm so glad I graduated from high school. I can't wait to go to college and reread the same kinds of things I did in high school and didn't understand. And you know, talking to him, if you said, so Juan Carlos, what is your favorite some what is your favorite season? I don't know. I don't know. Summer. You know. And um, why do you like summer? Because, um, why? Um, no school. Uh, and casual conversation in English is a lot of phrases and imprecise vocabulary. But I felt practiced with him for the interviews with the directors of the program, with the contractors. And if they say, so Juan Carlos, do you have any work experience related to the construction industry? 
Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. I do have experience related to the construction industry. You take words in the question and flip it back. For example, I volunteered for Habitat for Humanity. Don't, don't just give one word answers. Whatever question they ask, flip words in. And he's like, Mom, you won't believe it. After my first interview, they said, I'm sailing to the second one right away. And it's like, damn straight, because I practiced with them for a month, OK? <laughs> and, and I said, you look them right in the eyes, because even you know, in eighth grade, sweetheart, there's a man approaching us in the produce section here at the grocery store. I don't think it's just because mangoes are on sale. He has soccer attire on, and I think he was your assistant coach a few years back. What are you going to do when he gets here? Ojos, ojos, public voice. You know, look at him. You know, so when we look at the kind of register your students need to be engaging in to navigate curriculum, if you're asking a text-dependent question and you are having a class discussion and you say this reading, this informational text, is about the dreams and challenges immigrants face in the United States. So, what challenges do recent immigrants face? I don't care whether this was an AP US history class or a fifth grade class. Regardless of the student's background, you'll say, so, Vanessa, what challenges do they face? Um, jobs. And then often I'm finding the teacher doesn't even say, you're right. One common challenge immigrants face is jobs. If it, you get jobs, great. Anybody else? No volunteers? Oh, let me get my equitable misery sticks out. Um, you know, Jesse, language. Um, oh, Jesse, this principal just came in. Can you use a complete sentence like we always do? You know? <laughs> and Jesse's feeling persecuted and says, it's language. And <laughs> it's language is a complete sentence in conversational English. And I have worked with thousands of long-term English learners in middle and high school, and I coordinated our partnership program with K-12 schools called Step to College, and teaching partly so I could stay working with teenagers. But they are always like, when I show them in this class, because you're going to get transferable credit to um, college, this is what we're hoping for, to take words right from the prompt. One common challenge recent immigrants face is learning an entirely new language. When I show them that, not with this content, my question will be like, what is a movie you would recommend to appear? And I'll put that question up, and I'll say, this is how you're not going to talk in this class, because you all want sexy jobs. You want to go to college. This is how you answer. A movie I would recommend to appear is Black Panther. You don't just say, Black Panther. And I show them examples of that, and they're like, what? That is what teachers mean when they say, speak in a complete sentence? And I'm thinking, damn straight, nobody ever showed you that? You know, but they're like, wow. So we allow them to talk like this, to answer jobs. You know, and I'm thinking, why? Don't get so close to your students. I don't want to raise this affective filter. I learned that in my credential class. He's been in the country nine years. He can project his voice, and he can speak in a complete sentence. But when you bring out your state content standards, your benchmark assessments, or WIDA, part of the reason so many students are not rising to the occasion on the writing component of WIDA is because on the writing component, they're expected to have complete sentences, precise topic words, no grammatical recklessness, and it's got to be strong. So I'm not saying students need to speak like textbooks, but we need to have some supported times during the school week where they're not, we're not just saying, turn and talk, and it becomes sustained silent staring, and then they say two words. So one of the most research validated ways that we can support multilingual learners, and I would add reticent English only students who, are, who have voids in their vocabulary. Um, one of the things we can do is to provide a response frame. And a response frame isn't a sentence starter like, my idea is, and you know, they'll be like, my idea is, then it devolves. And um, so one, taking words right from the question and flipping it into a response scaffold and calling out the kind of grammar you need and giving them some examples, giving them examples so they can see a pattern and doing it projected so they can see it, learning a different language, finding a safe place to live. So 
you think of things, students, um, that immigrants have difficulties learning or finding or understanding. As I mentioned, I'm concerned about students from under-resourced households. Many, all students were victimized by distance learning and the pandemic, and that all students are AEL, academic English learners, and academic English needs to be taught. It's not just caught. And what I'm seeing in many projects, one of my goals is helping coach teachers to be mindful in their delivery, to not talk to them. You don't have to sound like a sixth grade boy to relate, to connect with them. You need to be a mentor. And um, when we work, when I work in upper elementary, middle, and high school, I'm mindful that in elementary, I just have a treasure trove. I could go on Ellen DeGeneres or some other show on HBO and do a stand-up comedy about my time in elementary. There, uh, but I hear everything like, whisper to your neighbor. I'm like, oh, that's why they're so inaudible in middle school. Because we had tell them to whisper for the last six years. Or like, you know, buddy buzz and things like that. And you know what? I never use think, pair, share, ever. Because they've heard that so much. Think, pair, share means do whatever you want. Nobody's thinking. They turn and stare at each other. It's think, pair, stare. You know, and there's nothing happening in there. And so teenagers are like, oh, great, this class, I can chillax when you say that. So what's endemic now in middle and high school is turn and talk. And I'm going to ask you to live on the wild side and use the word discuss and discussion. To actually say, students, in today's lesson, we're going to have an important discussion on different types of bullying that take place at school. You are going to have a chance to discuss ideas with your partner. Then we'll have a whole class discussion. I want students to have a trigger. Ooh, that's when we're going to use precise words. We're going to be more thoughtful, and it's more accountable. To really clean up our linguistic act when it comes to setting up tasks. I'm going to show a clip of me working with all long-term English learners. And we're going to be, these are um, ninth graders. and. All of them needed to get reclassified yesterday to actualize their dreams. And we're having a unit on um, adolescent sleep research. I want you to notice how I'm setting up the task with clarity that I'm, I'm like, OK, you guys, we're going to talk about an interesting topic today. Um, listen to how I'm trying to be mindful of my delivery, in part to expose them to words, but also so they're not having a lot of linguistic clutter. I know I've talked to world language teachers here who are also teaching English language development. In my experience, world language teachers, social studies teachers, English teachers, and English language development are the chatterboxes of the K-12 instructional world. We talk too much. And we need to, it's OK. We all speak very quickly, and we like to talk, and we're verbally comfortable, but we need to pause. And I've become more mindful of my delivery to be more efficient to be more precise, and then just to shut up while they're thinking and not keep going. So what are other reasons they don't sleep? Maybe, about, and the poor students, it's like they're assaulted with language and they never have time to think. All right, so let's see here. Today we're going to have a discussion on a very interesting topic for our issue. And this is a topic we'll be delving into in considerable detail because we'll be writing about it and debating about it uh, as we move through this issue. So, Let's examine our question. I'm going to read it aloud, then I'd like you to corally read it with me. What are the consequences of sleep deprivation? Let's read it corally. One, two. What are the consequences of sleep deprivation? And yesterday, we explored the noun consequence. And we have the plural form here. And we learned that consequences are effects or results of something that happens. So to remind us of the meaning, let's write effects right above consequences. So in this discussion, we need to give serious thought to the consequences or results of sleep deprivation not getting enough sleep, not just one night, but multiple nights throughout a school week. And notice how I'm not refraining from using high utility academic words, cross-disciplinary words. In our partnership with middle schools and high schools in the metropolitan San Francisco area, my fellow colleagues from ethnic studies, business, the English department, who volunteered their time to teach in this program, 
were just astonished by how impoverished students' vocabulary was. And we're not talking you know, sophisticated words like superfluous, but words like include, relevant, perspective. It's incumbent upon all of us to expose them to high utility words, so we're going to examine this section for multiple reasons, and all of this is very much aligned with your content standards. I'm going to urge you also to be mindful of what you say to reference students. Because when I see Southern California, I grew up, was born on the East Coast but grew up in San Diego, my parents are Irish immigrants, and my father, the word that bothered him most besides gonna and wanna was guy. And it's like, I don't understand why they're referring to you as a guy. You're a young lady and everything. And it's like, I have worked hard not to have guy be in my linguistic repertoire, partly because I see Southern Californians cannot say a sentence without, okay, you guys, so you guys, you guys. And the minute you say you guys to a bunch of teenagers, it's like, hoodies up, I'm back. You know, and so I like really go out on a limb and say, Good morning, students, you know? And I use all kinds of words. You're my language apprentices. You know, you're my language acolytes. And um, I'll write collaborators, but you know, I'm not calling them guys and boys and girls. I may call, say, sweetie, I'm a mom, to someone who's having a bad day, talking one-on-one. -on -one. But our students, I tell them, I want to train you so that you can be successful in school. And every teacher, every manager at work, Every romantic partner, everyone wants a, a, a spouse, um, a community, um, act organization, wants people who can be productive when they work with others. And a productive partner or team member is someone who is hardworking and focused, who gets the job done well and gets it done on time. And just teaching last week and being filmed teaching a group of long-term English learners in a high school setting in Phoenix, when I asked them, have any of you ever had an experience working with a student who didn't work very hard, you know, who wasn't really contributing, um, who was fooling around, and they're all like, every day. And so, so I told them, I'm going to help you. I promise I will never have a partner task or a group task unless I put thought into it and that it's really going to be a successful experience for you. One thing I'm going to urge you to do is to make sure you've assigned students partners, whether it's second grade or sixth grade. Because in my research, one of the most anxiety-provoking experiences for an English learner is to be told, get with a partner. You need to have an assigned partner. And not a life sentence, you know, but say for this unit or for two weeks, someone where every day they're not with someone new, and assign partner A and B, and I'm going to give you a little feedback on that. Um, what I tell students is in this class, we're going to observe the four L's for lesson partners, and whether with children or with teens, I've spent years going, okay, Jesse, turn this way. Anna, your partner's here. Look at her. And different cultures and communities have different rules and expectations around eye contact, and that's very important in Arizona and working in communities with native students. But they need to learn about body language too. If you're at a table, you need to kind of lean toward that person. Those habits die hard if you've been kicking back like this and not looking at the interviewer when you're interviewing for a job. But what I really want to focus on as a language educator is the vocal parts too. So that in our classrooms, in today's contemporary workplace, often there are a lot of people in one room working. And I tell students, the third hill is you need to lower your voice. Many of you speak very loudly, like I do when I'm teaching, but we're not whispering. What we need to do is get a just right volume, not whispering, but not yelling. Because if you are speaking to your partner, we have 24 students in this class. There are 11 other people talking, construction noise outside, lots of interference. And when you're interacting with a partner or team member, whether at school or work, we need to speak louder than we do in casual conversation, and we need to pause and emphasize. And just to show you how I'd practice this. So students, let's imagine our question is, how does a productive lesson partner show interest in a classmate's ideas? This is how you shouldn't talk. Well, you know, she like really helps me out a lot. 
And many of you today, when I gave you a partner task, I didn't even see your lips move. You, know, you were kind of engaging in mumbling. So this is how you would talk. A lesson partner shows interest in my ideas when she asks me questions, if she doesn't understand. So to really model that with students and have them practice with. Working with many teenagers, no one's ever told them that you speak differently when you're engaging in an academic or professional interaction or presenting than casual conversation. The fourth L, I'm convinced that every student in the United States needs a little help in the listening attentively department. Raise your hand if you have some students who have a tenuous grasp on attentive listening. Okay, <laughs> and so I, when I'm working with children and stuff, I show them pictures. Like, you know, yesterday when I came in and just watched your teacher, I saw a lot of fake listening and uh, inattentive listening, but for that reason, we're going to have listening goals in every lesson. Often, I'm going to have you say back your partner's idea. Another thing I want to train students on is how to ask for clarification. I'll say, what was your partner's example? Oh, you know, that's a, an interesting example. What does that mean? I don't know, he didn't tell me. It doesn't occur to them to interrupt their cognitive confusion. So they need to learn ways to say, I don't quite understand, can you explain that? And that's our job. With students, on the card I shared with you, there are many ways to ask for clarification and, and academic interaction targets. But I'm on a crusade right now nationally for us to spend more time on listening. We need to teach students how to listen and the language of listening. For workplace survival, and many of your refugee and immigrant students in middle and high school are also working after school. They need listening targets and comparing ideas or building on ideas or restating. Those are listening targets. So I have many example tasks for you. Some things I'm gonna urge you to are to arrange your seating. I go in and I'm just astonished. You have students with their backs to the front of the room. An English learner needs to see the front of the room and his or her partner. So with tables like this, I'd turn them perpendicular to the front so they can see their partner across, but also see the front of the room. And with students with interrupted schooling and newcomers, literally putting an A up on one side of the room and a B and say, you know, if you're closer to the A, you're partner A. If you're closer to the B. I'm going to urge you not to randomly partner and put thought into it and not to make any student a tutor putting your strongest student with your weakest. You know, not to do that. Um, if you have an exceptional student with many needs who's really not ready to be a partner, have that student be an extra B. I included on page 14 a little sort of script scenario for the four L's that you might want to look at. But in my work with teenagers, in this and upper elementary as well, and primary, this is very important, as well as um, a visual you might consider. Uh, I want to show a quick clip of me orienting a middle school class of all English learners, relatively recent immigrants, as well as long-term English learners. And I'm going to show a couple clips of them. But this, they had a long-term sub who was an unsuspecting science teacher building robots with them. And as I was at the K-8 school working with elementary, they're like, Dr. Gazella, as long as you're down here for a few days, could you go in and sort of help out um, our long-term sub? So I, every week, was going in for a couple days working with these adorable students in Silicon Valley in California. Take a look at me introducing them to how we're going to be interacting. Here we go. So good afternoon, students. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am so excited about today's lesson. We are going to really be jumping into our issue. And in the last class session, we talked about the four L's, about how you can really work with a classmate really productively. And today, we're going to do a quick review of the four L's, but also we're going to have a discussion about the kind of partner we all appreciate working with. So I'm going to be introducing you today to some of the ways we're going to be talking in class, that we're going to be contributing to class discussions, and interacting with our partners in groups. That may be a little bit different than the rest of your classes. So because we're going to be exploring the topic, of how to be a really positive partner, let's quickly review the four L's. We learned before that in the United States, whether at school, at work, at clubs, or at meetings, people expect you to really look 
at your partner's eyes. Let's all say, look at your partner's eyes. Look at your partner's eyes. And they don't want you to be bossy or creepy and stare at them, but just to look nicely at your partner's eyes and to keep looking at his or her eyes as they're talking to you. And what that means is, I'm listening to you and I'm paying attention to you. So as you're speaking with your partner today, and you'll have a few opportunities, be sure to look at your partner's eyes as he or she's talking to you. But it also helps if you lean toward your partner just a little bit. Many of you are right across from your partner, so to lean toward your partner just a little, and that means I'm really focusing on you, just like focusing a camera. So right now, could you turn and just lean toward your AB partner and look at your AB partner? Thank you, beautifully, and I appreciate how so you can see how I'm being very explicit with this and being upfront. Um, now, I want to, uh, on page seven, just to do a little simulation. It's difficult to do this in this environment, but I want to show a little simulation of setting up a discussion task. And I want you to pay attention to how I'm visually displaying, how I'm unpacking a prompt. All right, students, everyone should be, and with students, at the top of page seven. Please verify, that is check politely, that your partner is on the right page. And I will tell you, when I'm in classes with multilingual learners, nobody's on the right page. So make sure your partners point to the slide, point to the slide, thank you. Um, pe pencils up if everybody's ready, thank you. All right, We're, yesterday I introduced the four L's and we just reviewed it. In today's lesson, you are going to have an opportunity to discuss with your partner and participate in a class discussion. And because we're going to have partner tasks all year long, I think it's important for us to think about what makes a good partner. Let's read the discussion prompt. I'm going to read it aloud once, and I want you to silently follow along, to silently track. That means follow with your eyes as I'm reading and to look at the slide on your page. And if it will help you, you may use your finger or track with your pencil also if you wish. Describe the characteristics of a lesson partner with whom you work effectively. You're going to help me read it this time. I'm going to read a phrase, a group of words that go together, and you're going to read it with me and echo back. But I don't want you to just sit and listen, because if you don't actually read the words, you're going to have difficulty later with our task. Here we go. Describe the characteristics of a lesson partner with whom you work effectively. Thank you. Now that we've read that a couple times, I want to point out this first word, describe. Please circle the word describe. Describe's a direction word. It's an action word, and it's telling you what you need to do. Describe is a word you're going to see in many classes. And I'll remind you that when you describe a person, you explain how that person looks or how they act act or talk. You're going to be describing your lesson partner, but we don't really care that you're describing what her glasses were la are like, or her hoodie, you know, or her smile. What we're going to focus on is the way she acts with you, what she does, and how she talks. So what you're going to describe are characteristics. Please underline the word characteristics. Now, I know that is a difficult word to pronounce, Listen to me say it slowly, characteristics. There's five syllables. Say it slowly with me, characteristics. Everyone? Characteristics. Now let's say it quickly and blend it. Characteristics, everyone? Characteristics. characteristics is a word you are going to hear, just like describe, in many classes, in science, in English, in social studies. And what characteristics are are special qualities, special ways that person is. Please write special qualities above characteristics to help remind you what this important academic word means. So you're going to describe the special qualities or ways your lesson partner is, not your neighbor, not your best friend, not your sister or brother, and one with whom you work effectively. Please underline effectively. And let's say that word, effectively. Effectively is an academic smart word, and it's one we use at work and at school, and it means really well. It means he passed that ball effectively. 
you know, she sang that song effectively. It means really well. So we're going to be describing the ways your partner acts, what your partner says and does that helps you work really well. When we describe, we use adjectives. We use describing words. But since we're going to have an academic discussion, we're not just going to say nice, fun, good, or smart. We all want someone who's nice and fun and good and smart. But if I say someone nice, that might mean something very different to Raul or to Mina. So nice is an everyday word we use in conversation. But because we're going to discuss this, and we're going to write about it in a paragraph, we're going to use some precise words. And I have a few that you might want to consider using. Maybe you want a partner who's polite, who doesn't interrupt you, or helpful if you have a problem, or patient, and you can see what I'm doing. I try to pitch some precise words for them, meeting them where they are, where some that all my students would recognize, and then stretching, because I have not been in a single contest context with multilingual learners where there wasn't a range of proficiency. So trying to push them a little bit. You'll notice I put in tech savvy because this lesson, these students were in Silicon Valley. So I told them what that meant. They all thought it was the sexiest word they'd ever heard. And my example was I work effectively with a partner who's tech savvy and patient. And I told them many of the most tech savvy teachers are not very patient with me. And uh, so I want someone. And they're like, I will help you, Dr. Kinsella. So notice how I have for example or one reason is in a speech bubble. That's because when I do use a response scaffold, often I will have them elaborate. So um, one experience I have is, or for example, or so they elaborate with their spontaneous language. For this lesson, like throughout the course of a unit, I want lots of informal exchanges of ideas, reviewing, brainstorming, but I also want to populate my unit with some more strong scaffolds, uh, particularly if it's going to be supporting writing and reading and other more rigorous work. So, my experience in any class, we need to have a fast finisher task. I might just give the one uh, response frame. I work effectively with a partner who's blank and blank. But because I always have students who are ready to be stretched more, I like to have a frame often that's slightly different. But I think this is a good introductory task for academic interaction and learning academic interaction. Why? One, because it's supported. But it only requires putting in adjectives, which isn't so complex, for the first one, for both. But it also allows them to focus on content they know while they're practicing new interaction processes and using complete sentences. You don't want to go immediately to your science lesson for the first academic interaction. We need what I call community building lessons, where they're about things they care about. And I'm seeing the benefit of having them write sentences, to write their sentences, and to say, so they have a, a comfort level when they interact with their peers. But because I've worked, again, with some adorable slackers, they'll do their one sentence and just sit there idle. So say, your fast finisher task is to write a second one. Something I'm going to urge you to do is to make a slide, not just and display it, or have a big poster of ways to ask for help. I prepare a guide card, just blank on one side, like a color, like light yellow, but on the back side is how to ask me for help. And so as you're writing, feel free to call me over if I can help you with spelling or grammar or vocabulary. Now, I mentioned that I advocate that you have students share two or three times. If you have a pullout context and you only have multilingual learners, if they've written something, you tell them, read it once, then read it again fluently. The third time, say it with expression. And I'm not saying they need to memorize their whole sentence if it's a longer sentence, but to tell them, look down, look at your partner, and look up. And have directions like this that you can recycle regularly. What I'm seeing in my K-12 research on our teams is that when teachers just give verbal directions, even if you did it clearly, I want you to share twice. The first time to rehearse, the second time with expression, it devolves into one and done. Anytime we see verbal directions. So have some consistency like this. I also expect them 
Early on, I teach them to restate, just to say, so your idea is partly to build in accountability, to build in accountability because many of them in their content classes just sit in an upright nap. They're, they're not really listening very much. Um, also, if I have a modeled response, I'll say, let's get comfortable using the response frame with my idea. I'm going to say it with expression, then you're going to say it with me. I work effectively with a partner who's tech savvy and patient. Echo, please. I work effectively with a partner who's tech savvy and patient. Now let's pick up the pace a little bit. I work effectively with a partner who's tech savvy and patient. Something I want to urge you to do that has been a godsend for many students is I'm not one of those teachers who says, and don't you dare copy my idea. You know, that I, I'll give them a couple examples and say, you know, if you really appreciate a tech savvy partner too, or a patient one, feel free to take one of my ideas, but then add one. You might like a partner who's tech savvy and helpful, tech savvy and kind, you know, and let them, because your most insecure students um, really need that support. I am urging you to have directions for how we're going to report in the unified class. I will tell you as a researcher and recently observing classrooms with the Office of Civil Rights team, we couldn't hear a thing students were saying. In high school, middle school, elementary classrooms could not hear a thing they're saying because you allow students, regardless of their background, to speak in an inaudible mumble. So to project your public speaking voice and in this case, elaborate, to give them speaking and listening. And at times, I do have students stand, but those of you working with teenagers need to not always have them stand. No one in the workplace or college says stand up when you contribute. You have to get used to projecting your voice when you're seated. And I've worked with so many young learners who no one's told them they're inaudible. And it is very anxiety provoking. If you're at a community college in St. Paul and your teacher is saying, excuse me, what? What? They think it's pronunciation, but it's volume. So really getting them to get this concept of a public speaking voice. Um, and I also, again, call me Cruella Kinsella. I build in attentive listening. We are always comparing. But, but I also will say, because your classmates are going to be sharing examples of ad adjectives that describe the kind of partner they'd like, you are going to hear some different ideas. I want you to write down to record an interesting one you hear, or an original one, one that's new and different. In terms of calling on students, I want to show you a clip. Do not do this, desperate begging. Does anyone want to report out? No, Javi, no. I see middle and high school teachers, how much time is spent with them begging, but I also am really opposed to digital devices, to just having class dojo, recklessly, randomly calling on students. English learners have, are completely anxiety ridden. Um, I pre-select one or two students to go first to break the tension and pre-select students with representative ideas, but then let the second person select the next. So they don't just go, I don't know, I don't know, Leonel. They have to say, I select Leonel. And in working with children, we're finding our kindergartners, they can't read this, but they love the advanced expressions. And they're like, I would like to hear from my polite classmate, Leonora Chavez. You know, they're all, it's so funny, because I'll tell them, you know, we're trying to do a training video, just use select. They're like, I'd welcome a contribution. And so uh, it, it's fun, but we need, those are the workplace kinds of things. We say, well, I'd like to hear from Annette. You know, I'm interested in Leonel's perspective, but getting them afterward. So I told you to listen for an interesting original example. Share that with your partners. Now, I've emphasized the need to display clear directions. Those of you working with students at earlier proficiency, don't make them too verbose, uh, but with speaking and listening. And the echo reading that I'm doing is not for an entire text passage. It's to build oral fluency or if I have directions, or we're working on writing. Now that we've read that paragraph a few times, let's go take a careful look at the topic sentence. Do not do this with your students. Let's practice with my example. I work effectively 
with. When you do that, words aren't coming into their short-term memory storage in a meaningful way. You need to chunk words. So if they're just early decoding, you can do that, but then say, now, let's echo. I work effectively and practice that, but also anytime you read aloud, anytime you model something that they have in front of them, make sure they're looking at it. Because what I find, anytime a teacher reads aloud, they're acting like they're four, listening to their preschool teacher read Nancy Fancy Pants. They, they are not going to build their oral or reading fluency if you're doing that. Actually, I'm gonna show, in addition, I've already echo read, I'm gonna show students repeatedly sharing. This is another cost-free thing you can do that will have great positive impact for multilingual learners and that are content area teachers. It's a cost-free thing they can do to help them. Watch these students sharing more than once and you'll see me explaining to them and I want you to look at the benefits for them as speakers and learners. And one of the students you're going to hear also has an IEP and language as part of his IEP. Here we, so, here we go. right now, take another moment just to think, what are your two adjectives you wanna start with? And I'll put back up the list and feel free to borrow any of these that you wish. Feel free. Partner A's, please begin sharing three times and then B's, it's your opportunity to share three times. And students, if I haven't called time, saying three, two, one, please share again, each of you three times. Thank you, A partners. Please lead the discussion. I work effectively with a partner who is hardworking and focused. I work effectively with a partner who is confident, I mean, hardworking and focused. I work effectively with a partner who is hard working and focused. I work effectively with a partner who is tax savvy and serious. I work effectively with a partner who is tech savvy and serious. I work I work effectively with a partner who is serious and tech savvy. I work effectively with a partner who is helpful, real patient, and helpful. I work effectively with a partner who is who is patient and helpful. I work effectively with a partner who is patient and helpful. So notice they get in their groove. They get in their groove, and and in this case, you know, they these. There wasn't a student in that class reading anywhere near grade level standards. They were struggling readers. So that's why I wanted them to read it twice and third time. You know, say it with expression. I included a few slides, but for English learners, it builds their confidence and their oral fluency, and they often self-correct. But for listeners, an English learner needs more than one chance to hear what the partner is saying. And it builds in a chance for them to really hear and a chance for them to give feedback and some accountability. But for you as the teacher, it gives you a chance to get away from the front of the room and to monitor. I can go listen to some of their interactions and say, Stella, would you please volunteer that idea? I can see if they're having troubles. I'm going to wrap up here saying that the practices I was modeling and setting up a discussion using response scaffolds, using evidence-based practices like echo reading, like um, repeated sharing, those are examples of instructional routines. And the research base is very much pointing right now with multilingual learners that they have been victims of promiscuous pedagogy. Lots of activities, lots of worksheets, every teacher doing something different across the school day. An instructional routine is not a behavior management routine, but if you're teaching a high utility academic word, they should have a clear process for that. And it should be the same in science, the same in math, the same in English. And I included a handout on that academic discussion routine on page 15, and I included some guides. I included some examples of student-friendly initial academic discussions. I like topics, as I said, like this, like partnering, where it's also in support of the classroom culture I'm creating. And I included two, one pitched more at basic and intermediate and also younger learners. And those examples of precise word bank at the bottom, that's for you, not for them. A little cost-free tool you can do is give them a card to punctuate where they need to be on the page, because I find their eyes are never where they need to be. Put it under the frame, put it under that paragraph so they can do this. And finally, English learners need us 
to call on them in class, but they shouldn't have us be just relying on equity sticks or asking if they'd like to share. And I was in classes with caring, conscientious, thoughtful teachers and sort of asking their multilingual learners, they said, well, I don't want to raise their affective filters. They are high school or middle school or upper elementary students. In a class like yours where you do connect with them and they're not talking, when are they ever going to contribute? So some effective practices for calling on students. Um, in my work with school districts right now, I'm seeing that there are many strategies that they're using, but they're strategy rich and impact poor. And they can litanize all the things they're doing. And we just had all of our teachers have CRT training for a day. And then we did another drive-by on this topic. And we're doing all these things. But when I go into lessons, when I go into C, and your data doesn't show that that's working for you. So I would urge you to search your soul as an educator of English learners and clean up our act. Our students need fewer strategies, not more. They need high impact strategies that deliver. So I don't care what term you use, but what the research is showing us, we need to be selective. And I'll say, we need proven practices. We need high leverage practices. We need not just whatever flavor of the day. I know this has been a lot for one morning, but I hope I've given you a few strategies to ad ad agitate your pedagogy. And I'm going to be focusing on writing and on vocabulary later in the day. I'm also going to hold a speed date if anybody wants to come pick my brain for a little while uh, before lunch. Thank you so much. You're doing God's work. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you.